Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content, courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise.io online and join today. Today, my guest is Dolly Chu. Dolly is the Jacob B. Melnick Term Professor at New York University's Stern School of Business. She is also the author of two books, The Person You Mean to Be, and her recently published A More Just Future. Her 2018 TED Talk has been viewed over 4 million times. Dolly began her career in finance, working as an analyst for Morgan Stanley, and then she went to business school at Harvard and went into publishing as a marketing manager for Scholastic. After that, and four years in the human capital consulting business, she briefly returned to financial services but this time in a leadership development role before returning to Harvard to earn her PhD in organizational behavior and social psychology. She began teaching at NYU in 2005, where she has been ever since. Dolly also devoted a week or two each year over 10 years to work with KIPP, training and developing school leaders in underserved communities. Apart from her dual Harvard degrees, she has a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in economics and psychology. She and her family live in the New York City area. Dolly, welcome. Great to have you on the show today. JR, it is so good to be on the show and so good to be talking to you after so many years. I know this is uh, a lot of these episodes for me turn out to be like the reunion tour, you know, catching up <laughs> with people that, that I haven't really connected with in a long time. So let's start. You're a professor at NYU. Um, I am. Talk a little bit about about what your area of specialty is. Sure. Um, so I'm a social psychologist uh, with an orientation towards organizational behavior, like the class that you and I took in our first year of business school, which was right. focused on sort of psychology as it relates to the workplace. And I'm a professor at the New York University Stern School of Business. I teach MBA students, management and leadership courses. And then my research focuses on what I call the psychology of good people. And I've written two books, um, The Person You Mean to Be and A More Just Future. Great. So you um, you grew up in, mostly in New Jersey. I know you moved around a little bit when, when you were younger, but you ended up, I think, as a kid kind of settling in New Jersey. When you were in your teenage years, what did you envision yourself doing professionally back then? Yeah. So we I lived in West Texas uh, until I was nine, moved every year, never went to the same school more than one year in a row, and then New Jersey. By the time I was a teenager, I wish, I don't think I had a solidified uh, view on that. I was and am the kind of person who like uh, wishes she had a dozen lives to lead a do dozen different um, paths. Yeah. Because I'm, I remember in college, like once a month calling my parents and being like, oh, I think I'm pre-med. And, yeah. you know, and the next month, like, actually, I think I'm pre-law. You know, and, and it wasn't because I like lost interest in the other thing. It was because I learned about some new world that existed that I didn't know about and got excited about that. So I could just get excited about a lot of things. Yeah. Did you ever see yourself potentially becoming a writer back then? Well, I never imagined. Well, let me say two things. Uh, so my parents, you know, I, I, I wish I could go 24 hours without having the thought like my parents were right again. Like, it just seems like they're always right. Um, and they 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 were my mother, when I was a teenager, got me a subscription uh, to Psychology Today, the magazine. Um, that I had never asked for that. I don't think I even knew what it was. But she had learned about this magazine and often heard me kind of musing about how people are and why they are the way they are and said then, I think you would be interested in psychology. Of course, I would go on years later to get a PhD in psychology, but it, it took me, you know, 
a decade and a half to catch up to where my mom was then. My dad used to bring, um, I'm sure he must have like really, you know, in the, before the internet, like it must have been a big deal to go find this book or this this journal he found that had like writing contests. It was like a digest of all these writing contests you could enter. And I have no idea how he found it, but he he really saw me enjoying writing and felt I was good at it and used to encourage me to enter these writing contests as a kid. And I would like to tell you, I did win the Arbor Day uh, Writers <laughs> Contest in my town. Uh, we got a free tree as a result. Um, so there was something that they saw then about writing and, and psychology that it turns out many, many, many years later would be the core of my career. Yeah, well, they were, they were, they were right. You were mentioning your mother getting you a subscription to psychology today. It sort of brought back to memory. My parents, I think one year for Christmas, I was maybe 11, uh, got me a subscription to National Geographic. And I just remember thinking, these articles are really long. Like it was just <laughs> immense for me. So like the I, pictures I, are amazing. <laughs> I, yes, the pictures are amazing. I dutifully collected them. I kept them in a closet for years yeah. until I think they finally realized I wasn't reading any of them and it was just a oh. waste of money. So. Oh, I love that. But they must have sensed in you. I'm imagining your father sensed a curious mind, which look at you right now with a podcast where your curiosity is at the center. A curious mind. Yes. And I, I actually, I wrote a little short story when I was in seventh grade and went to a writing conference. Um, what I remember most about that writing conference is meeting Mark Brown um, who does Arthur, um, you know, the aardvark. And oh, uh, I got some yeah. custom artwork from him. And then a succession of mean-spirited English teachers just beat the love of the English language oh. right out of me until I was oh. in the cold. So anyway. That's awful. Well, maybe, maybe you'll circle back to it someday if you well, haven't already. I have a little bit already. So, but okay, nothing, nothing like what you're doing. So anyway, um, did you do any interesting jobs while you were in high school or college? Yeah, I mean, I did all sorts of things. You know, I bust tables at a busy Mexican restaurant in my my town. Um, I worked for a temp agency where you would get sent out to different yep. things. Like one day you were kind of, co co yeah, I kind of liked that because it was like different, yeah. like collating brochures, you know, manually and data entry and um one perfume company where I sort of had to help them like organize all the perfume. It was all different stuff. Um, and then I, I worked as a camp counselor for many years at a camp that I had attended as a kid. And I loved doing that. I think that was the, the job that I said I would do for free. They wouldn't have to pay me. I would happily do that job for the rest of my life. Um, and now I see elements of that job and what I do now and the teaching part of my job. Yeah. Yeah. I did this. Some, my temp assignments were probably not nearly as interesting. I, was it a car dealer? I was doing data entry mm -hmm. in all of them. Car dealer, um, a company that made extruded plastic material, you know, materials. I can't remember what specifically, a hospital. Yeah. It's all sorts of random things. It's so but cool. I, I think the coolest thing is a temp agency, uh, working through a temp agency is, you know, usually we only really know the work lives of the adults in our immediate childhood. Yeah. But to suddenly be able to see, like, in the span of a short period of time, all these different workplaces and adult lives and how, how, what, I don't know, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, different cultures and kind of what work yeah. feels like, you know, in very different yeah. places in probably both. Our yeah. So uh, you went to Cornell undergrad. Okay. How did you end up at Morgan Stanley um, in financial services when you graduated? Yeah, well, I mean, because I didn't have a very specific thing that I had decided I wanted to be when I grew up, um, and I was interested in a lot of things, when I was a liberal arts psychology and economics double major at Cornell, and when it came time to sort of start thinking about what to do next, we had an on-campus uh, recruiting process that, you know, we're very fortunate to have um, companies fly all the way to Ithaca, New York, or drive there and, and yeah. recruit on campus, and so I put Honestly, I just put my resume in for like everything, you know, like be a buyer at Saks at Fifth Avenue and, you know, be a editorial intern at, at Reader's Digest and go work as a financial analyst in investment banking. And so I, I put my my resume in broadly. I was very fortunate and then I I had I got a lot of interviews and I learned later much later, decades later, about research that's shown that when someone plays a varsity sport in college, what a leg up it gives them 
yeah. um, in the eyes of recruiters, you know, rightly or wrongly, like, but it's it somehow sort of is, it stands out in a, in a way. And um, I played varsity tennis in college. So I think I realize now my grades were okay. I mean, I sort of B plus A minus my way through college. Um, but I, I did play this varsity sport. So I think as a result, I had a lot of choices. Um, my father, uh, when we moved to New Jersey, it was because he was moving from moving, uh, working at Texaco in the petroleum um, industry to working in financial services. So I had been exposed to that world. And the, the analyst programs in investment banks were two years long. They still are in many places. Right. Right. Um, meaning you knew the day you started when you would leave. It was sort of a very long summer internship, you might say. You would work, you know, 100 hours a week while you were there. You would learn a lot but then you'd have an exit. And that seemed perfect for someone like me who did not know what she wanted to be when she grew up, but wanted to learn a lot, was willing to work hard, um, had had some exposure to financial services through my father. Uh, and I ended up having a lot of options of, of where to work um, in financial services. And Morgan Stanley, you know, I don't know what it was, but something just resonated with the people and the culture. And so I went for that. How did you like it? I don't regret doing it, but I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. It was really, yeah. really hard work. And yeah. um, I was, uh, you know, pretty sleep deprived for two years. And it was in service of what I knew was not going to be. I, I figured out very quickly this was not the life I wanted to lead long term. I wasn't intrinsically that motivated by the work. I was very intrinsically motivated by my colleagues to be a good colleague to them and my managing director. And I wanted to serve clients well, but you know, I worked in the leasing and project finance group and, you know, the idea of off balance sheet financing was just not the kind of thing that got me excited intrinsically. So I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot. I made very, very dear friends, you know, amongst my colleagues. And I'm, I'm also glad to have moved on. When, when did you decide uh, to think about business school? I think my, my not knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up uh, trend continued into Morgan yeah. Stanley. And I, um, you know, a lot of people in these analyst programs apply to business schools and go to business schools. And so that seemed like a logical thing to do. I do remember getting into business schools and um, I remember, I remember getting into HBS and telling my parents that I didn't think I was going to go because I just, didn't know why, like I wanted to have a why I wanted to have yeah. a purpose and like what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and since I didn't know it, it didn't seem wise to go pursue this degree. And my parents being like, I'm sure they were like inside, like, Oh my God, like panicking, but outside they were like, well, let's talk about that. You know? And of course they wanted me to go. They did not yeah. want me to turn away this kind of amazing opportunity that they had never dreamed of having um, as immigrants to this country. So I ended up going, but feeling kind of like perplexed as to why I was going and mm. feeling like, okay, this is the commitment I'm going to make to myself. I'm going to find an industry that I'm a passionate consumer of so that I can get excited about working in it, like about uh, building this industry because I'm someone who actually, you know, is on the receiving end of the industry and really loves it. And so I went into my job search, which began, as you might remember, like two weeks after we arrived, um, they started asking for our resume. Right. Um, I went into it with that mindset and, and with the mindset that I would not do on-campus recruiting, that I would uh, do an independent job search. So I was sure to kind of broaden my horizons. Interesting. And, and I know you ended up working for Scholastic. What did you do in between years? Yeah, I worked at Sports Illustrated uh, when Time Inc. Um, owned... Sports Illustrated and People and In Style and uh, Fortune. Um, I I, the, I decided the industry I was excited about was publishing because I was loved reading. I loved magazines. I loved books. You know, I just wanted to be in that world of publishing. And Time Inc. Um, was was a fabulous opportunity. I was very grateful to have. So then you ended up though you weren't there all that long, and then you ended up kind of shifting over into more human capital consulting. Yeah, so I was at, so Sports Illustrated was the summer internship. I had the opportunity to go back afterwards, but by that point, I had also cultivated this relationship with Scholastic, hmm. the educational publishing space, and I was really excited about that because that kind of merged two things I was excited about, the um, the publishing side, but also the education side. So I uh, decided to go for that opportunity instead of the Time Inc. opportunity, e even though I'd had a great opportunity, a great internship at Time Inc., 
Um, I had planned to stay at Scholastic much longer than I did. We had a family emergency that um, I was living in New York City, working at Scholastic. The family emergency was taking place in New Jersey. And I, you know, rented an apartment in the city and fully intended to live a, you know, post MBA New York City life. Right. And instead ended up um, commuting uh, a lot. And wow. this was a time, you know, when we really didn't have you know, we didn't have like the internet and the email the way we do now, like it, commuting was, was complicated. And so uh, literally on the train, I mean, uh, on one of these tr many train rides, I was very sleep deprived, just trying to deal with all the pulls in my life at that moment. And I remember kind of like almost falling asleep. And then I hear someone say, Dolly, and I look up and it's, um, I don't know, you might've known her. Uh, it, it's, she goes by Kim Keating. Uh, she was Kim Minton when I first met her. Kim Minton was in my analyst class at Morgan Stanley and also was at HBS, though a year, I think, behind us. Okay. Um, so we had crossed paths multiple times in our lives. And now here yeah. again on a New Jersey transit train, uh, we had run into each other and we had lost track of what each of us was doing. Well, guess what? It turned out she had this job she loved in human capital consulting just miles from my parents' home and uh, was just going into the city to see friends. And I was, you know, commuting for my job. And I was like, wait, tell me about this job. Yeah. I hadn't, I didn't do a single consulting interview in business school. Um, and that was by design because I had made a choice to not go into professional services. And again, wanted to work in an industry where I was a passionate consumer, but this was a circumstance where I, was very interested in being closer to my family and and having that flexibility. And she said, I would love to introduce you to some people. And she did. The company at the time was called Sibson. Um, and I ended up going to work there. It was an amazing five years. I'm so, so grateful that I ran into Kim that day on the train. Yeah, that's a serendipitous conversation. Yeah. If there was one, right? Ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and after that, I know you went back doubled down on Harvard, went back to get your PhD. <laughs> um, how did you yeah. decide to, to pursue a PhD and and why the particular areas that you chose? Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't remember specifically if you were in the room, but the way we're going to tell this story, you were in the room when I made the decision, actually, um, somewhat. I It was our fifth year MBA reunion. Yeah. And I remember that was in 1999 with the internet, like yep. going wild. Yep. And I was really dreading going to that reunion. Like I'm the kind of person who goes to reunions, who like shows up to the things. I'm, I'm just like that kind of person. Yeah. Um, but I really didn't want to go to this reunion. And um, it wasn't that I like was so upset with my life, but it just didn't feel like, you know, we were hearing about all these classmates doing these sexy things and um, I was single and I didn't want to be single. And I just felt like I was going to, even though I'm not an envious person, I was going to feel envious there. I mean, like yeah. the envy side, envious side of me was going to come out Yeah. and I didn't want to go, but I made myself go because, you know, I go to things and um, what ended up happening was like, you know, that first day where you're more interacting with your classmates, I actually was really enjoying the conversations. Like it was sort of fascinating to hear all these this internet thing that you know people were doing or the world wide web maybe we were calling it at the time yeah but i wasn't feeling this like oh i should be doing it like i wasn't feeling the envy take over the way i thought it would and then the second day rolled around that saturday where we go to the research presentations that the faculty did and that's the day when suddenly i felt envious of the faculty of all people and hmm. I will be honest, when we were MBA students, I don't think I really realized they were doing research. I thought they they were so good in the classroom and yeah. seemed to know us so well. And I just had the sense that they spent all day, every day thinking about us. <laughs> I did not yeah. realize that they went back to their office and collected data and ran experiments and, you know, wrote papers for, you know, at peer reviewed journals. I had no idea. I didn't really know any professors in my life at that point yeah. either. And so... When we went to that second day of the reunion and saw them present their research, I was just blown away. I was like, wait, someone pays them to do this? To like think of what they find interesting and curious and then go like learn more about it and then write it down and share it with other people. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it dramatically, but yeah. at the time that's what it looked like to me. And um, I was just blown away. I was like, I should have been a professor. Like I've totally missed the boat on this. Yeah. Um, 
it would take about another year and a half before that notion, which at the time it was like, well, I also should have been a rock star. I should have been Madonna. Like it seemed that realistic, like unrealistic, like yeah. good for you that you thought you should have been a professor. Um, so the notion hit me in 99, but then over the next sort of 12 to 18 months, these little serendipitous things kept happening. Um, and in each of those serendipitous things, which probably were happening all along, I just wasn't noticing them. Uh, I was learning more about the world of being a professor and it dispelled a few myths that I had, which one, I thought you had to be like a rocket scientist genius to be a professor, because that's how I saw all my professors. Mm. I'm not a rocket science genius. I'm sort of above average, intelligent and very hardworking. Um, it turns out that's good enough <laughs> for, for my line of work. And I also thought, you know, business school had been expensive and I thought it would be like five more years of tuition like business school tuition. Mm. But I learned that at least for the kinds of programs I was looking at, organizational behavior, uh, they actually pay you to go to school. You get paid a stipend. Right. It's not much. It's like $30,000. Right. And I was, you know, making a lot more than that, but, but it wasn't the same as paying tuition. So those myths got dispelled as I had these serendipitous conversations with people. And I got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to, in my, at age 33, start over and go get a PhD. I'm sure your parents are probably having another one of those internal <laughs> nervous conversations then oh, too. They were, they were so worried and I just feel for them. And now that I'm a parent, I'm like, oh my gosh, that lack of control over what's happening and like giving up yeah. a sure thing for this, you know, who knows what's going to come of this? And, uh, I, you know, they were very supportive and very worried. Yeah. Well, it's obviously worked out. Um, so you've been a professor for, I think, what, 17 years now? About that, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what do you like and what do you not like about it? You've been doing it a long time. And I know you're in a New York University studio. So this is a little bit unfair to ask you when, uh, you know, you at work. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is a wonderful studio that uh, Bob Kerr, who is a producer in in like the news world uh, before he came to NYU, has set up for us, and it really helps us have these conversations in a way that gives you good, yeah, hopefully good sound and an audio uh, video quality. Um, but I can, I can, I there's there's many things I like, and there's many things I don't. To be honest, uh, I love my students. I love teaching. I love research in the purest sense of like the piece I loved at the beginning of like, what are you interested in? How can you sort of create knowledge by collecting data or analyzing data that helps shed light on something that could be useful to people in the real world? I love that part. What I don't love about it is that, um, when I love my colleagues, I, I, I'm in an amazing department with really wonderful colleagues. Um, but what I don't love about it is the system of higher education I don't love. And yeah. this is not specific to NYU, um, though NYU is, is certainly in the same position as a lot of other institutions. I don't, I personally think that teaching and research should be sort of equal in importance. And in research universities, that's not true. Hmm. Many professors are deeply committed to teaching and are amazing teachers. Um, but the system isn't generating that as much as yeah. people's individual commitment to the students um, or their just love of, of that work. Um, I don't love that there's just a lot of, it's a system that seems to perpetuate itself. Like there's a lot of things that if we were building a university today, I think some pieces we would do differently, but it is this system faculty or tenured, like it's just hard to make change in yeah. higher ed. And so those pieces of it are frustrating. And then I would say the last thing, and this isn't a comment on the system of higher ed, this is a comment on my preferences. I have also really gotten more interested in speaking to general audiences, you know, through my book writing, through my newsletter, I have a TED talk. I really value doing that. It, it's totally appropriate that some universities care about that and some universities don't, but it's it's become increasingly important to me that that be part of how I spend my days. Yeah. And so that's something I'm trying to figure out how to sort of put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah. So let's let's talk about your book, the second one, the one, the one that was just released, A More Just Future. So um, congratulations on getting that published on top of your, your prior one. Uh, Thank you. So that's that's awesome. Um, 
give our audience an overview. Well, um, a more just future really is a book that I wrote because I felt like I needed to read it. Honestly, um, I I've been kind of grappling with my emotional relationship with my country, the United States of America, this country I deeply love, and then you know, having moments where I'm, I'm not sure what to think about, you know, learning that my forefathers of, of the country enslaved humans or learning about that when I read the Little House on the Prairie series to my kids, which I spent a whole year doing, um, and then went on vacation and took them to all the places, realizing sort of late in the game of doing that, that like, I'd forgotten to really teach my kids about how that land was Native American land. And like, yeah. I really didn't know how to talk about it. And like these little moments, you know, it's like, I felt like I was grappling with the Instagrammed version of my country was what I'd been taught. And I, I wanted to learn the real story, but every time I tried, these emotions would come up of shame or guilt or disbelief or anger. And I would just shut down. Um, and so I'm not a historian, to be completely transparent, I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm really not even a history buff, if I'm totally honest. But I am a psychologist. I do think about what is our relationship to other people? Why do we behave the way we do? And our emotion, re emotional relationship with our country sort of feels like it, it can be helped yeah. with the tools of psychology. And so that's why I wrote this book. You, you started it in 2019. So before... George Floyd was murdered before right. everything that's happened since then. So what was the catalyst for you to write the book? You know, that that the incident with the Little House on the Prairie uh, and my children, that happened about 10 years ago. And I've been thinking about it for the past decade that, you know, how is it that I, there was some unlearning I needed to do and I I didn't know how to do it, so I didn't do it. And then... I just laid it in the lap of my kids. And so yeah. over the last decade, I've sort of, and I, I feel like I've time and time again had moments like that, but it's not a parenting book specifically, but that was something very personally motivating to me. Um, after I wrote my first book, which came out in 2018, I knew I wanted to write another one because I really appreciated and enjoyed the process of writing and the process of uh, seeing readers discover the book and and mm -hmm. and tell me how, I mean, I don't use this term loosely, but like some readers talk about how life changing it was. Yeah. So I, you know, I wanted to do that again, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to write about. So I, I'm, I still do a lot of like reading print newspapers. So I would like, I like tear out articles when they're interesting to me. So I decided to go like, look on my desk and all the torn out articles that, by the way, I'm tearing them out. So I will read them someday, someday never comes, but at least they're on my desk. I decided to like look if there were any themes in the torn out articles or in some were printed out as well. And it turned out there was this pretty big pile of articles that were things like the so-and-so university is debating whether to rename a dormitory because it's named after somebody who was a leader in the slave trade. Yeah. Or, you know, so-and-so uh, team is just trying to figure out what their mascot should be. They've always had a mascot that that sort of um, demonizes Native Americans. Or, you know, something about it was like our current events were really historical events. Mm -hmm. And and I had a big pile of those stories. And so that said to me, like, there's something I'm stewing on and confused by and looking for guidance on and interested in. Um, so the the and there's something the general public is interested in. Like there's a reason why the New York Times keeps publishing these stories hmm. and the Wall Street Journal and all these other outlets. So I started playing with this idea. And um, when I went to my agent, Leela Campoli, she got it immediately. Same with my first book. She got the idea immediately. She was excited for us to sort of put a proposal together. When we went out to the publishing industry, we actually got a lot of interest in me writing another book but not a lot of interest in me writing the book I was proposing. Yeah. They, they were just, you know, I remember some people being like, Oh, but here are three other things you could write about. We would love to work with you on those things. I just don't think people are thinking too much about, you know, the land, you know, like whose yeah. land this was, or, you know, that. and I was sure that wasn't true because by that point, I had really started tuning in because I, you know, seen that pile of newspaper articles. I started really tuning into these conversations. I saw young people having them. I saw them happening on social media. 
it, I saw them happening in our policies and our laws. I, it was happening everywhere from what I could see. Um, maybe it hadn't become the national conversation yet, but I knew it was coming. I was, I'm a very risk averse person. There was no doubt in my mind, this was going to be a national conversation and my book was going to speak to it. Mm. So I felt very confident. Thankfully, Stephanie Hitchcock, who was the editor on my first book, she, she jumped in to, to work with me on the second one and also saw that it was a conversation that was coming. That was 2019 when we um, signed the book deal uh, with Simon and & Schuster. And of course, by 2020, 2021, this was a national conversation. Yeah, but it's a divisive one, right? I mean, I know you were a little bit nervous. You talk in the prologue, I think, of the book about you know, lying awake at night, worrying about you know, whether you were doing the right thing and writing this book. Um, yeah. What's been the reaction so far? Yeah, I mean, I, because, because okay, so like it went from a conversation that maybe wasn't as much in the spotlight to being suddenly in the spotlight and yeah. suddenly like critical race theory, which was a term I knew in 2019 because I'm an academic, but really only academics knew that term then. And suddenly it was the household word and it really wasn't being used accurately. And so suddenly it was part of this conversation that felt very explosive. Um, and I wasn't looking to be part of an explosive conversation, to be honest. So that's what was sort of keeping me awake at night. The reaction has been so far, and it's it's early early days right now, but um, incredibly positive, like more than more positive than I expected from readers. And I um, I think it's because like the way I was sort of grappling and and searching for a, a, a path into thinking about these issues and just needing like solid ground to do it. I think a lot of people are doing the same thing. And so this book, it, it offers like, you know, seven psychological tools for how to engage with the past. So it's like a great companion or prequel or sequel to like, if you're sort of, you know, thinking about like how your family celebrates Thanksgiving and like you're hearing Thanksgiving isn't what you thought it was in terms of its historical roots or right. someone's, you're wondering why Columbus Day is being called Indigenous Peoples Day or you know you didn't know the GI bill was primarily for white veterans and not black veterans and now someone's saying that and you're like wait what or you're hearing about Juneteenth like all of these moments of like discomfort and confusion for some of us um there are psychological tools that can help us yeah i mean it, you know you you talked in the beginning about you know just the the love you have for the country and you know, I think it really coming out of World War II, from there on in, it was like America is the best country in the world. And, you know, we were in the heart of the Cold War. So there was, you know, there was an ideological component of that Cold War, right? And, and you know, so you have whole generations of people who were really brought up with a very ultimately biased view of American history. And, some people are obviously really struggling to come to terms with that now that, you know, there's more discussion on it. And I guess it'd be great. You're a social psychologist. I mean, why do you think people struggle so much, you know, to come to terms with America's past and the good and the bad of it? Absolutely. And, and, and I'm in this group that struggles. So I, I, I speak with empathy, you know, we, I mean, there's two elements of it. One is that, um, some of the narratives we learned were partial, incomplete, sometimes not even fully true narratives. Yep. So that, that so it's hard to unlearn things. There's lots of research that says it's easier to learn something than unlearn and relearn something. That's intuitive. A lot of us have experienced that in many aspects of our lives. So I think that's one part of it. But the other part of it is um, nostalgia. You know, nostalgia is like mm. the most seductive thing ever. You know, there's billion dollar industries built off of nostalgia, fashion, you know, tourism, um, uh, music, like nostalgia, the research says gives us a sense of belonging. It yeah. makes us feel more interpersonally competent. Like we can sort of interact with people more effectively. Like it really makes us feel good. Um, and so our narrative, nostalgic narratives tend to be positive. And some of the narratives that we're learning now puncture that nostalgia and that feels awful. Um, so it's not just unlearning, it's like an identity I care about that has some nostalgia, you know, whether it's my ancestors or my my town, my state, my school, 
there is a, a narrative that I love about that that's being that's sort of being flattened um, with what I'm learning. So we resist both the things. We we resist the unlearning. We resist things that are sort of nostalgia busters, um, and 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 that puts us in a tough position when someone says, "Well, you know, actually, there's some things mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't hear. Like I didn't know that I didn't know that many of our forefathers." enslaved other people while they were writing those documents about equality and liberty and justice for all. I, I did not know that until like a few years ago. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it wasn't something I should have read once, maybe, but it definitely wasn't like the headline of mm -hmm. how we talk about our country. You focus primarily about the United States in, in your book. Do you think the United States is unique and having these kind of challenges of coming to terms with with its past? Yeah, so I'm not, I, I don't feel super well equipped to comment on that because I, I don't think I, I've i really done a deep enough dive into other countries. I do, in, in my book, talk about South Africa and Germany a bit mm -hmm. and what I've learned about their grappling with their own history and right. some similarities and differences between how it's emerging in their countries and ours. Um, we definitely see in that comparison some, uh, you know, like in Germany, there's more physical markers than we seem to have in public places of atrocities that took place there. Um, and so I don't know that we're better or worse, but I definitely, you know, it is possible, like you said, the greatest country on earth. You know, I grew up in a home where we we still talk about this country as the greatest country on earth. Like I, that will always be true. That's That's the narrative in my head both things can be true. This could be the greatest country on earth, matter of opinion, but let's go with it. And it could also be true that there are some very horrible things that yeah. have happened in this country and may have even contributed to some of the ways in which we uh, have called ourselves the greatest country on earth. Yeah. And you know, that, that concept of both and rather than either yes. or, I mean, for me, that's the thing I keep thinking about having finished the book, you know, a week or so ago. Um, yeah. Because it really applies, you know, if you can accept that your country's history, if you can accept that the person that you're friends with or your family member or whoever, yeah. right, that there are both good and bad attributes to everybody, yes. right? Yes. And you accept it. I mean, it's, it's, it allows you almost to sort of suspend judgment, right? You don't have to declare somebody as good or bad, right? Exactly. You know, they're, everybody's both you know, to varying degrees, but they're both. And, you know, that, I, I think that concept in the book, like I said, that was the, the the thing I most took away. I love that. I love that. And and um, the book, Both And Thinking, which I draw from considerably in my book, that research is by Wendy Smith, Marianne Lewis, and others. Their book came out earlier this year. Uh, I, I That has been life-changing for me, quite frankly, that way of thinking of yeah. just, and the research says that when we do allow ourselves, like you just said, to allow two contradictory things to be true at the same time, we um, experience greater resilience. We're able to sort of push through setbacks. We experience greater creativity. We're able to sort of see solutions around us, maybe because our bandwidth is released from trying to like resolve this contradiction to just being able to focus on other things. Um, mentally basically our brains kind of loosen up and open up when we yeah. activate what they call a paradox mindset yeah which is which is an important concept i'm curious to hear you know this is a career focused podcast most of the discussions are about career journeys and yeah let's do it. related topics you know how do you feel the lessons from the book in terms of reflecting on history you know how can people apply those in the way they think about their professional lives the the organizations they work in, the careers, the careers of ethnic groups who've been affected by some of these things over the years. You know, I'll say everything that's happened in America since the first settlers landed, just to make it very, yeah. you know, how, how can you take this into the work world? Well, I think every organization right now is either genuinely or performatively or something in between talking about DEI, so uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the being able to engage in a meaningful way on these topics, I think is sort of now part of everyone's job description to some extent. I What I'm seeing, because I teach MBAs, um, most of them are in their 
20s or 30s. And what I'm seeing in that generation of MBAs is a clear expectation amongst many of them that managers and leaders need to be able to engage meaningfully on these issues, not just DEI, but on societal issues. There's been studies that have also shown this, that that we're um, expecting more out of leaders, out of CEOs, mm. in terms of multiple stakeholders as opposed to purely shareholders. So I think the more tools we have in our toolkits to do that, the better. And so uh, for people navigating careers right now, uh, there's part of it is like, let's get out of the, you know, let's let's for, begin by sort of knowing what not to do, um, building some awareness there, and then maybe add some tools to our toolkit on how to support the kind of values that maybe we're bringing in, but don't know how to manifest um, and and all of these. And, and then lastly, I'll say, you know, I teach a class. Uh, this is not the title of the class, but in my head is what I call it. It's basically how to be a great boss. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the semester, the punchline is, it's not a course about DEI at all, but the punchline by the time you get to the end of the course is if you're not an inclusive boss, you're not a great boss. Because mm -hmm. if you're not an inclusive boss, you're only a great boss to a few people, not to everybody. Right. And so, um, you know, if, if, if anybody who has any aspirations towards sort of on their career going down the managerial or leadership path, this is being, this is a really important set of skills and tools. Yeah. And, and, you know, work like pretty much any institution is stacked in favor of a certain population, right? I mean, some companies do a better job of overcoming that, but, you know, on balance, the work world has been, you know, skewed in favor of white men and, you know, even today, you know, we're trying hard, but we're not there yet in terms of creating, you know, true equality. And, and so, you know, the way to think about it, um, you know, I, I can't make up for, you know, the things that happened in the 1960s in the Mad Men era, right? And, you know, all of the bad behavior that happened 50, 60 years ago, but you can at least right. be sensitive to the fact that even though it was 50, 60 years ago, the, the, the things that it, resulted in are still kind of relevant today, right? I mean, it's still yeah. having an impact, you know, even a couple of generations later. And, and you know, you, you've really got to work hard. I think empathy, you know, certainly is yeah. back to your, what, it, what makes a great leader. I mean, being empathetic to the fact that the work world even today is not an even playing field and doing your level best to make it an even playing field is, you know, I guess what all of us can be thinking about doing. Yeah, well said, well said. I love, I um, uh, can't remember if it was in The Advice Trap or The Coaching Habit, but one of Michael Bungay Stanier's books, he talks about the weight rule, the why am I talking rule, hmm. which I find really useful in so many domains in my life. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good, good acronym. Like, it's a good acronym. Um, my students love it as well, but it's. I think it's a good one in sort of navigating one's career as well. You know, yeah. there's spaces where, it makes sense to just listen. Yeah, absolutely. So this is your second book. Your first one was, um, you know, much more focused on being a good person, I think is sort of the, you know, the easiest way to describe it. Um, you were, you know, a professor toiling away, working hard, teaching your students. You published that book and all of a sudden you had kind of a coming out moment. You know, you were on <laughs> TV and, and being interviewed in all these different places. What was that like for you back then? It's a little exciting and a little scary. And um, and then it also kind of comes and goes pretty quickly. It's amazing like how quickly, you know, people's attention move on to other things. Yeah. Um, I do. Which has to be a little bit of a letdown when it starts to happen, right? I mean, both actually. Yes. I mean, sort of like who doesn't like validation? I mean, I love the validation yeah. and sort of the attention of it. But then on the other hand, there's a... I don't know, like, especially I'm an introvert and there's a level of sort of engagement, especially with social media that's expected. Yeah. Like when you write a book, I think what a lot of people don't realize is writing a book is 50% writing and 50% marketing your book. And yeah. that's expected even if you're at the biggest publishing companies. You know, my first book was HarperCollins. My second was Simon & Schuster. Um, but it's pretty standard that authors, I think of myself almost as an entrepreneur, you know, sort of out there, you know, hustling, marketing my book. And a lot of that doesn't have to be, but the easiest way to do that is social media. 
but that kind of engagement I also find like fun it's like a party it's like fun for a while and then I kind of want to go home yeah. um and 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 I'm exhausted and so I I'm very grateful for the opportunities and visibility I have and at the same time I'm also grateful that I'm not like quote unquote famous like I think my work is visible in certain circles yeah but I'm not like you know like a lot of people don't know who I am most people don't know who I am and that's perfectly fine with me yeah it's it's uh you know I guess good to have a sense of accomplishment without it necessarily running away from you which obviously it right. does who, who achieve a, a high level of fame right um, you took that book um and translated it into uh your dear good people newsletter that you put out mm. how is that following built over the years yeah it, you know it for a while my editor my agent like just readers had sort of suggested I should do something like that and I was resisting it honestly I was just like who needs another email in their inbox? Like, you know, I just, and I, nor could I really figure out what I'd be saying in this newsletter. Um, and then after George Floyd was murdered, I suddenly felt like I had things to say. And so I decided to go ahead and start in June, 2020. And it has, it's definitely been a labor of love and become one of my favorite things I do every month because I think the newsletter idea when I originally heard about it sounded like something inauthentic and like forced and businessy mm. kind of marketing-ish but the the newsletter I put out every month is like genuinely coming from what I'm thinking about right now what yeah. I'm wrestling with what I'm having fun with so you know like you know when I'm still doing Wordle every day with my husband but like yeah. when I was really obsessed with Wordle like you know in January 2022 I think it was um you know, I did a whole, I did one of my issues was about Wordle and why DEI efforts are not like Wordle. We love Wordle because it's, you know, kind of bounded and simplistic, not simple, but simplistic. It has a clear right or wrong answer. It has a beginning, middle and end. That all feels good. That is not what DEI efforts feel like. And so I yeah. use like Wordle as a way to sort of talk about that difference. Or right now I'm obsessed with pickleball. So I've, you know, used the fable of where pickleball got its name to talk about racial fables and how they kind of, you know, sometimes set us up to misunderstand the world we live in. So I, I, I'm able to kind of take what's happening in my life. My puppy shows up pretty often. Um, I'm able to take what's happening in my life. And I think what's relatable for a lot of people and in the zeitgeist and yeah. connect it to the DEI effort. So it's gone from being something I felt like I kind of had to do obligatory yeah. To being something I felt like I had something to say to now just being something where I feel this incredible connection to the readers. Like I get lots of yeah. um, very nice notes afterwards and it's it's just been an incredible community we've built. Yeah. And you know, one thing I guess I found with some of the short form writing that I do is it gives you a chance to kind of put into words, as you say, something you're thinking about right then and there that sometimes forms the kernel of an idea that turns into something bigger over time. Yeah. You know? And and that's, that's a great insight. And and I I like being able to go back to some of those things and saying, you know, here's the this long version of it. Like I'm not going to expand on that concept and kind of make it into something bigger. Some of them never, you know, they're whimsical ideas, right? They never right. go past that point. But um, some of them actually, you know, turn into bigger ideas that that stick with me, right? And that that part I find helpful. I love that. I I love sort of. Um, process, like seeing how ideas form or writing develops draft over draft. And what you just said is so cool. Yeah. So I have a lot more work to do on this front, though. I have not published any books. So well, um, you're, you're busy. Um, Want to be mindful of time. Uh, you're doing a lot of different things. What do you do to recharge? Yeah. Well, pickleball lately. Pickleball <laughs> lately. Really and the puppy. Yeah. Yeah, and the puppy. And the, well, the puppy sometimes recharges me, and sometimes he exhausts me. But he's cute, mm -hmm. no matter what. Yeah, you do. Um, I love to read. That's something that's important to me. Um, I don't love to exercise, but I do think it helps me, and so therefore, I guess it's part of the recharging effort. Um, and then you know, I spend time with my family, which uh, my husband and I we go on walks, we see shows, we watch sports together. My kids are teenagers, so it varies what they're interested in doing with me. But like yeah. when they are kind of engaged in the same things, same activities, that's fun. Um, yeah, those are those are the, the crux of it. 
Yeah. Last question. We haven't really focused, you know, a whole lot on career lessons. What, what would you want people who are listening or watching to take away from our discussion in terms of, you know, the things that you've learned over the years that you feel like are, are like the most valuable career lessons that you've, you've gained over the years? Yeah. Well, and I, 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 I'm hoping that sort of just the, the discussion we've had about my trajectory sort of offers one possible path, which is that you don't have to know right away what you want to be when you grow up. I clearly didn't for a long time. I'm still not sure I do. I still, I'm 54 and I'm not sure this is my last career. So I think um, not, not all of us have, my parents did not have the luxury to sort of make those kinds of changes in their lives. Um, and, 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 and I do, if you have that luxury, I think one should take it seriously. I, I don't yeah. see any reason to sort of uh, feel dead inside or, you know, be unhappy doing what you're doing. Um, when you and I were, I don't think you and I had the same professor first year for organizational behavior, but Jack Cabarro was mm -hmm. my professor. And I remember him saying to us that, um, that we should all have go to hell money. Right. And, uh, and that was, uh, when I, when I became a professor, I actually pulled some folks in my section. I was like, okay, so what do you remember from business school? What should I make sure my students know? Yeah. And go to hell money was probably the most popular concept that came up. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, is referring to the idea that um, within whatever constraints you have, you may have, you know, caregiving, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities that cost money, you may have student debt, you know, there may be a variety of reasons why uh, you don't have excess money, but within whatever discretionary funds you have to think about not locking yourself into a lifestyle yeah. that forces you to stay in positions you don't want to be in jobs. You don't want to be in bosses. Yeah. You don't want to work for, um, you know, practices you don't want to endorse to be in a position that you can say I'm yeah. out and walk away. Yeah. I, I, uh, I certainly remember that as well. Um, I've thought about it a lot, you know, over the years, as I'm sure we all have I, to me, the corollary of that is, you know, just avoid the golden handcuff situations, right? Because you get into some jobs that have a lot of deferred comp, and it's yeah. like, you know, you leave and you're walking away from so much money and you just think, I, I can't do that. And so you stay and you stay right. and you stay. And it's, you know, it's, um, right. you know, at the end of the day, people would all be better off if they could be where they're like happiest and most engaged. And I, I, I understand the concept of deferred compensation at the same time. I think, you know, I've been in companies where I think it's actually worked against them because it creates mm. kind of a zombie class, you know? That's so interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, look, I uh, I told you we'd keep this to an hour, so I'm going to be good to my word. It was great catching up. It's been a fun conversation. I appreciate the time. Thank you, JR. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I hope the book continues to have good success. I, I look forward to uh, seeing it on the bookshelves and you know on the bestseller list. So, <laughs> Well, it's already on the bookshelves. We'll see about the bestseller list. I know it. I have to go out looking for it on the bookshelves. So <gasps> that's true. That's true. Well, well, I, I, I enjoy doing that. I walk into bookstores and say, would you like me to sign my book for you? And they always say yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, uh, take care of yourself. Awesome. Thanks, JR. All right. Thanks, Dolly. Take care. Bye. I'd like to thank Dolly for joining me today and sharing her journey. If you're ready to take control of your career, visit pathwise.io. If you'd like more regular career insights, you can become a member. It's free. You can also sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow Pathwise on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.